was this man who worked with some of the greatest actors and musicians of the 20th century? Who devoted his life to preserving music of unknown authors? Who helped win the Academy Award for the first black in a leading role? Who conducted more choirs than any man of his day? who did more to spread his brand of uniquely American music worldwide than anyone in his century, whose power of presence and magnitude of personality won the hearts of people the world over. Amen. 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 Nick Amen. 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 Not amen. Amen. One of the most popular of all the black spirituals. Written by Dr. Jester Hairston. Jester Hairston, a national treasure. Let's go now. Good Lord, have mercy. He's probably worked with more young people than any conductor living today. He has been as much an ambassador for goodwill as he's been an arranger and an actor, you know. First thing that I think of is his smile. He's been like a bridge of communication between various ethnic groups. Well, as far as Jester is concerned, we're all children of God, and he treats people that way. Jester was so amazing that Hollywood recognized that he had this ability. When he took the podium, it was like we could feel it, and we could feel it to the depths of our soul. Wherever he goes, he's loved, you know. You are a living legend in your lifetime. Legends. Some people become legends by virtue of what they do, and others by being around a long time. Jester Hairston, well, there's a man who qualifies on both counts. We're not only celebrating a remarkable life, but we're spotlighting his dedication to a unique art form that marks Jester's legacy. And his song, Amen, has come to define that legend. Amen became his theme song, sung the world over. But the melody has its origins buried in history. It's part of the collection of songs, the roots of ragtime, blues, jazz, and gospel music, even America's first homegrown music known as the spirituals. I'll bet you've heard songs like Many people have heard and sung these songs and mistakenly call them gospel music. Take it from someone who has sung gospel her whole life. They are really gospel's granddaddy, the spirituals. Anything or anything that's kind of related to religious music that was created during, during slavery, we use this catch-all term, spiritual. He is the unquestionably the world's leading composer and arranger of Negro spiritual music or black spiritual music, what do you call it? Negro colored black Afro-American folk song. <laughs> no one really knows where the spiritual came from or when the spiritual actually came into being. It's just like any other folk music. It's an anonymous music. That to me is the miracle of what spirituals are all about. Is how could an illiterate people, not ignorant, but illiterate, come up with such magnificent melodic material. Surely spirituals were very much a part of the African experience here in North America by the 19th century, because by that time, many more Africans had been introduced to Christianity. They said, look to God, you will be free someday. Not in this land, but somewhere. So that engendered a lot of imagination. 
like uh, using prophets uh, in the material of Joshua at the Battle of Jericho and go down Moses and uh, Daniel, Daniel, servant of the Lord. You see, these were all paraphrases of biblical material that they had heard preached by the circuit preacher or by somebody in the group that could read. So the spiritual is a universal form of music that I think anyone can identify with because it just deals with human issues where people really want something better and this is one way of getting it by expressing it through music. In many ways, the spirituals echo the life of Jester Hairston. For Jester, it was a rough road. I was born uh, in Blues Creek, a little town in North Carolina, July the 9th, 1901. My grandparents, two generations before me, were slaves of the White Hairstons. The White Hairstons were among the largest slave owners in the South, and at the end of slavery, many blacks on the Hairston plantations kept the family name for themselves. The blacks, after slavery, uh, pronounced it H-A-I or Hairston. The A-I is a Scottish diphthong. The Yankee school teachers came down and taught the blacks how to mispronounce their own name. So they pronounce it in English, and the blacks say Haston and the whites say Haston. I think so much of that uh, relationship because this man, Peter Haston, and I have been friends for, oh, 30, 35 years. We've been friends a long time. Just as a remarkable fellow, when we search the records, his, my grandfather owned his grandfather, which he always likes to catch me in front of people and tell. But the truth of it is that then I tell him, that's all right, he owns me now because he really does. My father died when I was a year old. My sister was only three days old. And then my mother and her f whole family moved on up to this little hilly town called Homestead, Pennsylvania. Nothing but steel mills, that's all it had. My mother worked and washed clothes for people, kept house and did whatever she could for a dollar and a half a day. And my grandmother, reared my sister and me. My grandmother was a slave and all of her relatives were slaves in slavery days. And, and all the stories they told me when I was eight, nine, 10, instead of having a television with a lot of gangster stuff on things, all I got was the stories about the slave songs. I had such a rough life. I started to work when I was 10, and uh, we made bricks to uh, build the furnaces in the steelworks, steel mills. As a youth, Jester loved sports and was a guard on his college basketball team and a quarterback on his high school team at only 130 pounds. So I call, call signals and get the heck out of the road. That's all I did. <laughs> Upon graduation, Jester wanted to attend the University of Pittsburgh to study landscape architecture until he discovered they would not permit blacks on the football team. But I won't be treated this way. It took me altogether nine years to get out of college. He graduated cum laude from Tufts University in 1929. Then I started, after, after I graduated, I started getting little jobs in shows in, on Broadway and, and around and singing at choirs in New York. There were many, many work songs, and they grew up after the uh, uh, conflagration, after the Civil War. So then they made up little songs that would help the work seem lighter, you see. The one that we're going to do now is uh, called This Old Hammer. This is a work song uh, where these men in this song are uh, laying rails. <laughs> Keep a driving, <laughs> driving, <laughs> Keep a driving, <laughs> driving, <laughs> Keep The first big job I got was in a Schubert show, a show called Hello Paris. And that was a Schubert musical, and that was really it, wonderful when you could get into a Broadway musical. I, I joined that choir, 
and I worked with them two seasons. We went two seasons out of New York and all over the country and back again. Hard work was no stranger to Jester, but this was the beginning of the Great Depression, and work, especially for a black in the performance arts, was scarce. About this time, Jester became acquainted with an exceptional musician, the leader of a prominent Harlem all-black choir, Hall Johnson. Paul Johnson was a very fine musician, and so he went right on in after he came up to New York into arranging these Negro spirituals, and he got his reputation on that. And he got a choir together, and they, they started to sing them seriously, you know, and uh, I auditioned for him. He took me in there as a singer. But Jester had to undo some of his formal New England music training. He told me, too, he said, you got to go, Ashton. We, we can't stand that. <laughs> he said, we say can't and ain't. You say shan't and can't. And that's right. <laughs> that's how to go. And Hall Johnson was the cause of my quitting all that New England stuff. And spirituals, he said, in spirituals, you can't say that. During that time, Hall Johnson was asked to be the musical director for a new Broadway play called The Green Pastures by Mark Conley. The Hall Johnson Choir sang 24 of Johnson's compositions and arrangements of spirituals and were actors in this Pulitzer Prize winning musical. Along with Broadway musicals, radio programs were very popular and music played an integral part. While one choir toured with Green Pastures, Jester formed and directed another choir to sing on the radio. We did the music to uh, uh, the Green Pastures on Broadway and then Warner Brothers bought the play for a movie and we, they moved us out to uh, Hollywood to do the music. As assistant conductor, the rail was laid. Jester left New York in December of 1935 on a train bound for that golden hammer, the promised land, Hollywood. One of the problems with black music is that the tunes and the ideas are so captivating that everybody wants to rearrange them and they overarrange them, they become too sophisticated and lose some of that spontaneous naturalness that Jester's arrangements have. If you know the scores that Hall and Johnson have written, they are multi-parted. You've got eight, 10, 12 parts. These pieces actually limit performance because how many choirs are you gonna have those kinds of resources? And I think one of the things that made Jester so popular is that he began to write more reasonably. The piece that probably uh, reached more people or more choral directors and choirs early on was his arrangement of Elijah Rock. Jester recounts how he and Hall Johnson found Elijah Rock in 1932. By convincing a very old but stubborn former slave into singing old spirituals no one had ever heard of. They said, if you ignore him, he might sing for you. So I didn't even pay him any mind. I led everybody, all of his family, in, in songs. East side, west side, all around the town. When you wore a tulip, a sweet yellow tulip, everything but a spiritual. And after a while, he felt let out. And so he hunched me in the ribs. He said, you boys know this song? And I said, what is it, sir? And he says, Elijah Rock, shout, shout. Elijah Rock, and as he started, I turned to him this way, and Hall Johnson had manuscript paper there writing in the back. <laughs> and so I led the interference while Hall was writing, and, and I wrote this arrangement based on what this old man was saying.
Jester arrived in Hollywood at Christmas time, 1935, to do the film The Green Pastures. Although the picture gave Jester a fast start on his film career, hold on wasn't advice for the ride. They were watchwords for endurance. Hold on. The Green Pastures, written by a white man, told Bible stories through the eyes of 1930s black children. Even today, the film has a unique charm. Although Rex Ingram brought a quiet dignity as the Lord, Green Pastures relied heavily on stereotype images. This was the era of the Great Depression when this movie is, is released, and you have no idea watching this film, uh, that America is a land that in the South you still have Jim Crow laws and regulations. You have uh, no idea that you have de facto segregation in the North and the East. You have no idea that it is a struggle for African Americans to find work, that they're still in a system in which they are repeatedly discriminated, and that there is this growing, um, there, this growing anger. You, you need to go to That's all right, Shorty. He's just playing. Yeah, but the choir not only did the music, they were extras and had bit parts. That's Jester peeking from behind the Lord until he finally gets his own chance to present the Lord his offering. No, thank you. I'm going to save this a bit. The choir had a fortunate turn of events by meeting a famed Russian pianist, Dmitry Tiomkin. Tiomkin was just starting his career as a film composer, but was destined to become a major legend in the industry. Tiomkin had been hired by director Frank Capra to score the music for his new film, Lost Horizon. When they asked him which choir he wanted to do the, the music for, this was his first time in this country. He couldn't even speak English hardly. He said the Hall Johnson Choir, and they hit the ceiling. And Dimitri st stunned him. He said, I don't see colors. I hear sounds. I am a composer. I don't see colors. And that's the choir I want, you know. And they didn't have, had no, any conception of that type of <laughs> relation with blacks at all. But finally, they, they succumbed. The choir was supposed to do that picture. We did. And, uh, but Mr. Johnson uh, became ill right at the beginning of the picture. And I had to do most of the arranging and training the choir. Welcome to Shangri-La. Nominated for six Academy Oscars in the 1937 awards, including Best Picture and Best Music Score, Lost Horizon won for art direction and editing. When the picture was over, he was so pleased with it, he said, Jester, if I have another picture in Hollywood, you will be my uh, choral director and arranger. Over the next 20 years, Jester did the choral backgrounds for numerous Tiomkin films, including Duel in the Sun, It's a Wonderful Life, Home of the Brave, Red River, Land of the Pharaohs, Friendly Persuasion, Rio Bravo, and the eerie portrait of Jenny. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dmitry Tiomkin. Tiomkin was one of the great all-time uh, film composers. Uh, and he loved Jester. He used to call him Baby Chick. Baby Chick, what's this? Uh, Baby Chick, what's that? I had charge of the choir. He, he would give me his arrangements. Ooh, you're talking about tough music. Because he, he 
had no key signatures, you know, just start off and then any key. Uh, one card with a whole lot of shops, you know, and things to it. And it, I didn't know what key was anything. I had to learn all of that stuff and get it. And uh, it was just hell for me. I remember distinctively on uh, a picture called The Land of the Pharaohs. Dimitri Tiomkin was the musical director. And Jester Harrison was given the responsibility of training 40 singers, 20 men and 20 women. It had to be done in the Egyptian language. And you know, it was all done with headsets on because the orchestra had been pre-recorded. So things had to be absolutely precise. Well, you were given only three hours in the morning to learn the score. And in the afternoon, we synchronized the score to the film. So there was no time to be fooling around. Everything had to be right like him. Boy, you make a mistake. You can't see that? <laughs> Gee whiz, that'd be terrible. I'd stand there and just stay, take it. Well, he came in that afternoon when we were preparing the score for The Land of the Pharaohs, and he was not happy. He said to Jester, what did you do? Did you hire a lot of, uh, of uh, janitors and farmers and Gardeners, and that's what he said. On the sands of the desert, you will raise a pyramid, a structure greater than any other in the world. I remember one scene, these big stones that would close the opening to the sepulcher were held in place until the soldiers on the outside took large mallets and broke clay pots that would make these huge rocks slide into place. That was done to music. Literally almost every note had to work with these huge rocks sliding into place. That was Jester's job. And up until this day, you will never see my name on any picture of Dimitri Siamkin because I'm black, that's all and I did it for just whatever he'd give me, with no hard feelings. And why carry any, any hardness or, or any feelings against people for that? That was what we had to do in this country to get by. Either do it or don't do it. And I did all of his pictures for 20 years. I, I, I got, have God to thank for him. Keep that house in your heart, Lord, you straight in the promised land. For a while, Hollywood felt like a promised land. Jester and the Hall Johnson Choir made a number of short subject pictures. These short films usually had as their base the choir singing spiritual arrangements, and the singers often had roles on screen. Where's the Don't you make no mistakes. Last time you told us that he liked to ruin us. Like Green Pastures, <clears throat> this short used a black setting for the biblical story of Samson and Delilah, and Jester as the captain of the guard. What you doing here? Get out of my house. All right, boys. Now you stay away from me. You knows what I've done to you before. Bring him along, boys. You can't do this to Samson. Oh, no. We done done it. <laughs> Oh, he comes saving better running home. President Roosevelt's WPA, Work Progress Administration, sponsored numerous plays and musicals around the country under the Federal Theater Project. Jester got involved and became the choral director for Showboat with Paul Robeson in 1936. Jester was the music director for Hall Johnson's musical, Ron Little Chillin'. They called on Jester to take the show to San Francisco as director and music director. Jester auditioned singers from the Bay Area to sing and act. It was so successful, they asked Jester to stay and direct as well as do the music for another show. He selected the Swing Mikado, a takeoff on the Gilbert and Sullivan musical. It opened in 1939 as part of the World's Fair on Treasure Island in the San Francisco Bay. Jester 
introduced several innovations in the show and played the part of Coco, the Grand High Master. It was here he fell in love with a member of his chorus, Marge Swanigan. They were married in 1939, just to gain a devoted daughter, nine-year-old Jean Marie. Jester called it the high point of his life. As creative work again got slow, Jester felt compelled to work as a waiter in an L.A. hotel. He found it disheartening to resort to waitering after his taste of success. There wasn't much choice. He had a family now to support. As World War II began, Hollywood did its part to support the war effort. Frank Capra produced a series of documentary films for the Army called the Why We Fight series. Dmitry Tiamkin did the music for these pictures, and Jester's talent was called upon again. In The Negro Soldier, Jester arranged the choral score, prepared the choir, and conducted the choral numbers found throughout the film. In another of the series, The Battle of China, Jester led his choir through several segments in Chinese. By 1943, Hall Johnson and most members of the choir returned to New York where the waters were perhaps less troubled. But Jester stayed in L.A. where he served in the USO and formed the first integrated choir in Hollywood, the Jester Hairston Choir. He informed the studios his singers were capable of doing any music from Bach to Basie. But I always had a mixed choir. I never had a black choir. I always had a mixed choir and, and mixed it with the best singers I could get who could read, mostly. In a period of just six years, from 1943 to 1949, Jester's choir did the background music in 40 films. While continuing to work with Tiamkin, other composers also sought after Jester's abilities. With not enough choral work, Jester continued his attempts to further his acting career. It was truly an humbling experience, for Hollywood yielded little opportunities for black talent. I had so much education, <laughs> and still was nothing but a doggone extra in these pictures. Produced in 1942, the Vanishing Virginian, starring Frank Morgan, was Jester's first feature film with a speaking role. How do you expect me to get my work done with you two banging around out here like a couple of bellowing bulls? Don't you want us to wait till you get through, sir? Yes, by gad! He also got screen credits for arranging the spiritual Steal Away.
In the Preston Sturgis film, Sullivan's Travels, Jester plays a bit part as Charlie, the preacher's assistant. Down easy, Charlie. The Charlie's a little late. <laughs> He also arranges and conducts a key song in the film, the spiritual, Go Down Moses. In 1943, Jester's big break came with a chance to play characters in the longest running, most popular, and successful radio program ever produced. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Amos and Andy Show. Amos and Andy followed the adventures of two Southern blacks and their neighbors who had made the great migration to northern inner cities in the early part of the century. The remarkable part is that all the characters were created and performed by two white men, Charles Carell and Freeman Gosden. They had come up through the performing ranks in the minstrel and vaudeville shows. The roots of Amos and Andy can really be traced back to the minstrel show, which becomes popular during the 19th century. Minstrel shows start as early as the 1840s. These were troops of, of white males who traveled around the country. They had observed uh, the slave population in the South, black humor, black music, and they did parodies of this, and they went in blackface. It was burnt cork that was smeared onto their faces, and of course, um, the, the mouths of the, of, of the minstrels were um, very grotesque, and um, you saw under this, this fake blackness these wide eyes, and it, it was a very caricatured portrait of African Americans, based on something they assumed was real, but distorted. Gosden and Carell, as Amos and Andy, performed in verbal blackface, a continuation of the minstrel tradition. Labor's got a funny way of treating a man. Don't seem like there's no justice. Well, what's the matter, Kingfish? Did uh, your brother-in-law die? No, he coming to visit us. <laughs> It became the longest running radio program in broadcast history. 32 years on radio and had 78 episodes when it moved to television. Jester joined the cast in late 1943 with bit parts. Uh, Buddha, uh, Buddha. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm looking for a man here, kind of a big man. Uh, do you know how he's dressed? Well, the only thing I can tell you is that he looks kind of like a bum. Uh, all, <laughs> all right, I'll keep an eye out for him. A bum, huh? Say, wait a minute. Is that him standing over there? Oh, no, I'm looking for another man. That's Andy there. <laughs> Later, he played the part on radio and TV of Leroy, the Kingfish's lazy, shiftless brother-in-law. The radio show had its detractors, an early controversy as an inaccurate and derogatory representation of African Americans. But the show was immensely popular, even among a majority of blacks. The detractors would soon grow quiet until the show moved to television in 1950. In front of a live audience who would view the first show as a projected film, its creators introduced the characters. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to introduce one of our principal characters, uh, the character of Henry Van Porter. We looked all over the country for this character, even looked back in Virginia, had tests made in every state in the Union almost, and we found him right under our nose here in California. His name is Jester Harrison as Henry Van Porter. And then Henry Van Porter was a, a member of the Kingfisher's uh, social group, only he was very prissy. Even with an immensely talented all-black cast, it was only a black show on the outside. There were no black producers or writers or directors. 
It was a caricature beloved by millions. It was derided and resented by enough vocal people. So volatile was the reaction that CBS, who bought the rights from Gosden and Correll, locked it away in 1966 and refuses to allow showing even short excerpts. While his radio and TV work continued, Jester found his way into several Tarzan pictures as an extra. So I've run uh, uh, na naked in the Oh, yeah, through more Tarzan uh, pictures than anybody's ever seen. Yelling, one of this and one of that. I was a witch doctor, and I had on my witch doctor costume, you know, and so forth. The spirit say death! The, the three lions were down in the pit, and I was pointing down in the pit. They throw him down there. And for some reason or other, Tarzan and I got got the fighting up there, and both of us fell kaplunk down there. Most the three lions, one there, there, and there. Lions, great big toes standing out there. Boy, that's a scary thing. And every time you raise your head up, look at these lines looking right down at you, you know, and up like that, take that. And so, the wife's mother said to me, so what you thinking about, Jester? I said, well, if you want the truth, I was just praying that if they decide to eat one of us, that their preference today is white meat. <laughs> I said, I hope they like white meat instead of dark meat today. Jester's work was far from done. In Band of Angels, Jester not only arranges and conducts all the choral numbers, he performs a vocal solo and leads stars Clark Gable and Yvonne DiCarlo to a plantation welcome. In the early 1950s, Jester's choral talents were tapped by nationally popular orchestra conductor and film composer Walter Schumann. The voices of Walter Schumann recorded two hit albums of Jester's arrangements for Capitol Records. While working with Walter Schumann, Jester began teaching at a yearly summer music camp for advanced high school music students at the College of the Pacific in Stockton, California. This was the beginning of a long relationship where students were introduced to Jester's own brand of instruction. He was clearly the most popular teacher on campus every summer. The camp often closed with a concert with Jester conducting a thousand voice choir. He spent much of his time in research, lecturing and working on new arrangements. His popularity as a guest conductor and teacher expanded greatly. Jester would have other hit songs that decade, including one that has become a bona fide Christmas carol. Harry Belafonte recorded it almost 25 years ago, and it's called Mary's Boy Child. Long time ago in Bethlehem, so the Holy Bible said, Mary, boy child, Jesus Christ, he born on Christmas Day. You hear that song? That's my song. Three of the Metropolitan Opera Singers right today have all have records on that song, that particular song. He earned the part of King Moses in the radio series Bold Venture. Starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. 
Set in Havana, Cuba, just as King Moses was a calypso-singing West Indian entertainer for hotel and boat owner Slade and his female partner Sailor, played by Bogart and Bacall. This suggestion is open to all who hear, and for Joe Ryan who will shed a tear. He was a man cut it who out, King. tried to win twice. I said cut it out. Mr. Slate, I was only trying to put into music yeah, with But the... you're not looking at the look on Slate's face, King. I, too, am unhappy about what has happened. This of my music is how I feel about it. This is the only way I know how to tell about it. Go out and sing it to the seagulls. See what I mean? Jester would sing and have a part in virtually all 78 episodes. Humble. It was more than just a bell that rung and got Jester on the fast track at the start of the 60s. John Wayne was at a peak of popularity in producing and directing and starring in a gargantuan epic, The Alamo. Tiamkin was picked for the music and Jester was again involved, but this time as an actor. He was the only black man in the cast of thousands. He was Jethro a slave to Jim Bowie, played by Richard Whitmark. Uh, Colonel Bowie, you say I'm a free man? That's right. Well, if I'm free, then I got a right to decide what I'm gonna do. Seems to me that's what you men are fighting for. So I reckon I'll, I'll stay. Jester spent six months on location at the full-scale Alamo set on a ranch outside Brackettville, Texas. True to form, he made plenty of friends in the surrounding towns and took many opportunities without pay to teach his music at the local schools on his off days. With Tiamkin composing the music for the Alamo, Jester was selected to sing the hit title song, The Green Leaves of Summer, in the film. The song is featured the night before the final battle. The scene was shot as shown in these stills, with Jester singing and playing a guitar among the soldiers. But in the final version, his solo is cut. From this feeling, I wrote Green Leaves of Summer, and Paul Francis Webster put lyrics, and Chester Hairston, who will act in picture as a slave for Jim Bowie, and who will sing to this thing. His recorded audio version did survive and was used for his lip sync in this promotional video, broadcast to advertise the premiere of the film. Time just for planting, a time just for plowing. A time just for living, a place for to die. T'was so good to be young then, to be close to the earth. Now the green leaves of summer are gone. Stands up, y'all. I stands up, y'all. <laughs> Soon after, a Jester Harrison arrangement was selected as the theme song for a quaint little film set in the desert of Arizona. I, mean, I ain't no nun. I'm nobody you can boss around. In the 1963 Lilies of the Field, Sidney Poitier plays a black handyman looking for work. He meets several German nuns who feel God has sent him to help build their chapel. Lots of luck, mother. I ain't building no chapel. Yeah, you. He eventually agrees and in the course of their friendship teaches them the song. Frankie and Johnny were lovers. Oh, Lordy, how they could. You 
erase that one. Sidney doesn't doesn't have a, what we call a singing voice, you see. I sing one of them uh, down-home go-to-meeting songs, and you're going to have to help me out. You join in with me, all right? They say, you know you know the voice of it? I say, well, sure, I've been teaching it 20 years. And they said, well, uh, you, you, uh, you sing it. And then they find out that they liked my voice, you see. Amen. 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 Now come on. Amen. Sidney was very, very good at that. And that's that's what we did because he sat across the table from me and washed my lips. See the baby, eh? and we do do that. Ooh. And and but he had rhythm too, and didn't miss a note. Didn't miss a note of it. He was wonderful. See him in the temple. Sidney won the Best Actor Oscar for his performance, the first African American to win in a leading role category. Amen becomes Jester's theme song and his most requested number. Amen, amen, amen. As people became more aware of Jester's unique abilities, his opportunities expanded. Starting in 1961 and continuing through the decade, Jester was called to be a U.S. Goodwill ambassador to teach the art of singing spirituals and folk songs in many countries, particularly Europe and Africa. I can tell the world, I can tell the world, I can tell the world about this, about this. I can tell the world. They sent me all, all over the world teaching people in those countries how to sing. Uh, black folk songs, the, the songs of my ancestors in, in every country. All over Africa, made four trips to Africa, and uh, Yugoslavia. You yeah. should have seen me teaching the Yugoslavs how to sing Rock of My Soul in the bosom of Abraham. <laughs> Sixty-five, they sent me to Mali, West Africa. But they were speaking French, and I didn't know a word of French. I had to learn French because I stayed there three months teaching in, in a conservatory of music. And I just picked up French by osmosis, you know. And we learned my spiritual. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Bear some on arm, sous la poitrine d'Abraham. Bear some on arm, sous la poitrine d'Abraham. And so forth. Ah, ah. Oh, I'm just getting into it. Why, they're clapping like they had some sense out there, my friend. Yeah. The minute that I said to these fellas, Bear some on arm, everybody said, Oh, we got you, you're home. <laughs> Africa is the, is the home of rhythm. And then I, I, of course, I knew from studying, but then I found that these people, rhythm to the black man in Africa is music. His whole concept of music as an art form is rhythm. It's not music unless it has some sort of motion. Your ancestors in Europe, music to the European is melody. Now that you've learned it, I want you to clap your hands as you feel it. And, and every one of them, this is what I learned about my race of people in, from Africa. Every single one of those black people, and they were all blacker than I am. I wrote my wife, but they said they call me Blondie. They think I'm a new black. <laughs> but, but here's what they did. Uh, rock my soul in all of them. Rock my soul in the bosom of... I said, oh, no, for goodness sake. <laughs> I've been bawling white people out in the United States for 40 years, telling them how wrong and square they are, and come over here and find all you brothers clapping wrong. <laughs> There isn't a high school choir in the United States of America that hasn't sung one of the compositions or the arrangements of Jester Harrison. Jester has had a great influence on bringing the spiritual into the public schools. Uh -huh. 
he's probably worked with more young people than any conductor living today on a first-person basis, teaching them what the spiritual means as well as how it sounds. Because he would tell stories like, I want Jesus to walk with me, his biggie, uh, with, with a woman on a slave block being sold, and he'd say, you can't sing that piece unless you know this story. And I mean, you'd be in tears. And if you think that way, you can sing it with a, a reverence and, and a meaning that to me is very, very important. This whole family is being sold today on this auction block. And so uh, one man comes up and he buys this woman. He, the man doesn't want the baby, you see. And so she has to take her baby and give it to her oldest child and say goodbye to her children, to the girls, to her husband, and to these boys. So she steps down, leaves this family never to see them again in life. That's slavery. That's what they, the blacks had to go through. Their legs are chained, and then one long chain goes through this way uh, to keep them from running away. So they have to pull and, and synchronize their walks. And she starts with this song like this. I want Jesus to walk with me. The girls represent this woman leaving her family, the Sopranos. That's our theme, that's our theme. She wants Jesus. This is a new religion to her because in Africa we had our own religions. But now we're over here and we're forced to forget all the religions that we have, have had all of our lives and forget our culture and take the, the culture of the white man. And his God is white and so now she's worshiping Jesus and putting all her dependence. And she's out of sight now of the family and she's emotionally wrought up and then she's tired. She's walking, the man, he wants to get to the boat on time so he hits these, these men and her, to get along there, get along there, we've got to get that boat on time. And, and she's walking and then she says, Lord, as he hits her with the whip, Lord, I want Jesus. So they walk, they walk, then she's walking. Now they, they quicken up the tempo, you see? So they're dragging her too, and after a while she's so exhausted, physically and emotionally, that she just staggers, you see? And then we say, walk with me. I, I put staggering notes in here, and they go like this. Walk with me, oh Lord. So she's staggering along, staggering along. And finally, she gets so, she's so emotionally and so physically wrought up and tired, exhausted, that she falls down. And as she falls down, he has no mercy on her at all. To him, she's inventory, just like the cows or the sheep on his, fa on his farm. And he kicks her, says, get now, you black wench, and you've got to go. And he, when he hits her, she says this, give us the key. The girls. The girls represent this same woman. Come on, girls. Leading, leading to this white God to come and help her down on the ground and this man kicking her like that. That interpretation of the song, that breathing a storyline into it so that whenever you sing it, you get this mental picture, and it changes the whole performance. His commitment to sharing the art of the spirituals was foremost in his career, whether he was teaching children or some of the finest choirs in the world. For many, many years, the choir did nothing but broadcast and do formal concerts. About 25 years ago, that began to change 
when the record companies asked them to do some lighter repertoire and they began doing Broadway music. But we've never really, uh, although we've done spirituals, absorbed them into our musical culture to the d degree that Jester's helping us to do with the, the kind of free outburst of emotion that he can elicit from a group. You are now at, at the throne here, you see, and you, you're weeping about Jesus. I'm gonna give you a good downbeat in the first one, and it's all mournful. One, two, three, four, woo, two, three. Go through the suffering of Jesus along with me now. Come on, let's go. Pull it. You know, we work the technical things first to get the rhythm and the notes and that sort of thing, but. When Jester works with a spiritual, that's important to him, but what's more important is the spirit of it, the essence of that spontaneous joy that comes with a spiritual. And so he'll, he'll do a lot of things to try to elicit that from the choir. We are, yeah, I get that chord in there. All right, let's go, he crucified. Let's go. Pull it, pull it. That's it. Hit it. Come on. Hit now the word. Come on, now dance. Pull it, pull it. In the rehearsal, Jester used a lot of examples from the history of the slaves, uh, bringing poignant stories about how the music developed from life experiences, uh, bringing the, the essence of the music up into the emotional arena rather than into the intellectual arena. And I think that's the only way that a, a white choir can really establish a connection to the black music is to feel what these people were feeling when they sang these songs. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sound like white folks. <laughs> if you had to, if you had to lay it like we did <laughs> so many days, you'd sing it right. <laughs> lady, <laughs> lady Israel, oh. Now come on to joy. Good gracious. <laughs> My grandmother should be here. She's where every one of you are Baptist. <laughs> Goodness, you sound so Baptist in there. My gracious. I thought we were going to save some souls here for a few minutes. I say it's all over me and it's keeping me alive. King Jesus is keeping me alive. Certainly something special kept Jester going as he intensified his guest appearances with a heavier acting schedule. This includes parts in To Kill a Mockingbird, Lady Sings the Blues, In the Heat of the Night, Bingo Long in the Traveling All-Stars, and Motor Kings, and numerous TV shows. He was a series regular on That's My Mama. Why can't you cheat? Cheating? Why, that's an insult, and I ought to ask you to step outside. Oh, yeah! If you go after cheating, you wouldn't notice. <laughs> Oh, you carry the big theme of this song. You stretch. In Finian's Rainbow, starring Fred Astaire, Jester was in his element as part of the gospel quartet with it. Roy Glenn, oh, Keenan Wynn, and Avon Long. I got it. We got, got it. it. He said, give me my cane. He said, give me my hat. The oh, time has come. While 88 years old, Jester was asked to join the cast of a new sitcom called Amen. 
He became the oldest continuously working actor ever in Hollywood. As the Deacon Raleigh Forbes, he brought a special curmudgeon feistiness that was a far cry from the real jester. Ladies and gentlemen, Raleigh and the rappers. <laughs> Up that goose and wrap the present for me. So I said to you, uh, whether far or near, have a very merry Christmas and a happy new year. The show ran for five seasons. All the while, Jester kept up a full schedule of choral rehearsals, guests conducting on many weekends, numerous TV commercials, TV guest appearances, and continued travel. He was awarded five honorary degrees. He even got his star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame. His traveling schedule would have exhausted any man. You know, the last time we were together, this close was, remember when? The July the 9th, my birthday. That's right. In, In Estonia. Right. Russia of all towns. <laughs> they invited him to this major event, and there you have it. There is the audience of 250,000 people, and in that, what looks like a band oh, shell, yeah, audience. are 25,000 people. And in the, the little, choir. That's right, 25,000 people in the choir, and this nice guy got up there and directed them in singing Amen, Amen. It can rightly be said with John Lovell in his classic work, Black Song, The Forge and the Flame, that Jester Harrison has been the cause of more people singing spirituals in more places than any other single individual. But the spiritual is in trouble. Spiritual singing in many cases is a dying art. The gospel side of Afro-American music is taking over to such a degree that not many people are singing pure spirituals anymore. The only place where you can now find spirituals is uniquely in some chorales like mine, some churches, not most of them, some, and a, and a lot of the uh, predominantly black universities and colleges. Those are the only repositories. Because ministers these days, they don't care about this anymore. They want to drag people in, and they think the only way they can do it is to have the drums beating and the instruments playing and people jumping up and down. while well, they've forgotten all about the heritage of our people, which is in the basic foundation of choral singing, spirituals. I always include a Jester Harrison in my programming, always. And Jester lived for one reason, if not for any other, and that is to keep the spiritual and other secular pieces of the, of the era before the singing public. I just hope that conductors and choral people in schools and universities will look at that repertory and never let it die. I pray over these songs and pray that God will will uh, give me some insight as to what was in the minds of the slaves when they created certain songs, you know, what experiences were they going through, experiencing. The more I've gotten into these spirituals, uh, there's so much a part of me that, that I have prayed for the opportunity of, of taking them as far as I can around the world as long as God let me live. Yes. 
Crucified. 